From telephones with cables to wireless radio waves, it changed how we communicate. From a back-breaking chore to zipping across the floor, it revolutionized house cleaning. And from watching the birds fly to doing it ourselves, made anything seem possible. They're all inventions of the 1900s, the decade that kicked off a century and a techno revolution in day-to-day -day life. From AM radio to air conditioning to the airplane, they're the inventions that shook the world. Whether it's somebody talking or somebody singing, you can hear their voices thousands of kilometers away. Thanks to an invisible force called a radio wave and an inventor who turned that wave into a highway for sound. In the late 1800s, Reginald Fessenden is one of many scientists fascinated by a concept called spark gap transmission. He's hoping it's the ticket to a great leap forward in communication. If only these sparks could generate waves of energy strong enough to carry a human voice. The idea of sending any kind of message wirelessly is still revolutionary. The newly invented telephone needs cables to carry a signal. So does the telegraph when it sends out messages in Morse code. But demand is growing for communication that doesn't need wires, especially in the shipping industry. The problem with maritime transportation in terms of communication is that once a vessel leaves the port until it reaches its destination or at least approaches land at a very short range, it's unable to communicate. Um, so there's an understandable desire for safety reasons, for commercial reasons, uh, to be able to communicate uh, wirelessly with, with these vessels. Sending a voice across an ocean without wires would be a huge breakthrough. And even more amazing if it's a guy like Fessenden who didn't even finish high school. As a young man, he worked for Thomas Edison, laying cable under the streets of New York. He worked in literally digging ditches, but because he was clearly one of the brighter people in, in that crew, he soon achieved a promotion and was eventually hired by Edison's own lab and very quickly was appointed Edison's chief chemist. Fessenden proved to be naturally brilliant at everything, from chemistry to electrical engineering. That got him noticed by another big name, Westinghouse, where he worked with X-ray machines and other things that use electromagnetic radiation. He was lured by George Westinghouse himself to what is now the University of Pittsburgh to run the electrical engineering department there. Fessenden realizes this could also be the key to a breakthrough in wireless communication, an idea that becomes an obsession. A few decades earlier, scientists had figured out that electromagnetic radiation is all around us. It produces invisible waves of different lengths and frequencies, everything from X-rays and gamma rays to radio waves. Fessenden wants to use radio waves as a kind of highway to carry a voice signal. But in order to do that, he has to create radio waves artificially. Because the slow-moving voice signal needs a starting point where it can be linked up with a speedier radio wave. That's why Fessenden's using spark gap technology to create artificial radio waves. It's two balls and a charge is built up between the two balls. So literally a spark will go from one electrode to another 
that causes an electromagnetic wave to be emitted. It's invisible, but it, it can be very powerful. Problem is, a radio wave produced by the spark method fades away quickly, so it's not able to carry understandable voice signals, and it makes a nasty noise. Because essentially spark gaps create artificial static. That's exactly what they are. His reports from 1899 indicated that he heard very little except sparking. As Fessenden ponders how to solve this problem, a European makes headlines. On December 12, 1901, an Italian called Marconi transmits a wireless signal in Morse code across the Atlantic. What surprises Fessenden is not that Marconi has pulled it off, but that he's bragging about it. Initial reaction to Marconi's claim that he had sent the letter S across the Atlantic in 1900 was intense skepticism. And indeed, a lot of people were skeptical about it. Uh, 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 the consensus initially was that Marconi had not actually sent the letter S. There were some problems with the claim. For one thing, they knew it was going to be the letter S that was going to be sent. And for another thing, they knew when the message was going to arrive. If Marconi had sent a wireless voice across the Atlantic, now that would be news. For years, Fessenden has had an inkling that Spark Gap was not the answer. A walk to the pond gives him a new idea. The concept of a continuous, unbroken wave. He understood that if he just kept throwing the rocks in, it would approximate waves that never stop. Fessenden wonders, if you create one long, strong, continuous radio wave, will it be able to carry a sound, like the human voice, for hundreds, even thousands of kilometers? A continuous wave is very simple. It contains a constant amplitude, that is, the, the, the distances between the tops and the bottoms of the peaks is exactly the same. Fessenden thinks it might be possible to create a continuous radio wave with a machine called an alternator that turns mechanical energy into electrical energy. But he needs a machine hundreds of times more powerful than any alternator in existence. And this was a formidable problem for engineers. He wrote probably the greatest electrical engineers in the world at General Electric asking them if they could build such a device, and they told him they could not. But they would work on it. By the summer of 1906, General Electric does deliver a high-powered alternator. But even this machine isn't powerful enough. So Fessenden spends months making his own adjustments to produce an even stronger electrical current. Now, he thinks he's ready to test his theory. He hooks the alternator up to a microphone at one end and the world's largest antenna at the other. Here's how it's supposed to work. When a person speaks into the microphone, it creates sound waves. The sound waves will hitch a ride on the much stronger, faster moving radio waves created by the alternator. The alternator then sends this composite or modulated wave to the antenna, which transmits it to a receiver in some faraway place. It's much like a hitchhiker getting onto a bus at the transmitter and then getting off the bus at the receiver. On Christmas Eve of 1906, in Brant Rock, Massachusetts, it's time to put Fessenden's theory to the test. Hundreds of kilometers away on the Atlantic Ocean, ships suddenly receive a message in standard Morse code. What have you got, lad? Be prepared for something of great interest to follow. It's a heads up from Fessenden, who wants to make sure every sailor is paying attention to what happens next.
It's an astonishing sound. For the first time ever, a voice is transmitted over great distance without cables and wires. Fessenden has successfully transported sound on a continuous radio wave, a concept called amplitude modulation, or AM radio. Far earlier than any other wireless inventor, Fessenden understood how AM radio was going to work. It wasn't until the 1920s, however, that the broadcasting boom began to take off, but it spread like wildfire, faster than probably any other technology has ever spread, including the internet. Fessenden doesn't get rich or become famous from his invention, but there is one sweet victory. His Italian competitor, Marconi, has to admit that Fessenden got it right and buys a license for his patent. Other big ideas of the 1900s? 1903, the electrocardiograph, or EKG, records the heart's electrical impulses and diagnosis without surgery. It transforms medicine and wins its inventor a Nobel Prize. 1901, fingerprinting, the signature that can't be forged and leaves the bad guys in a sweat. And 1908, cellophane, clearly indispensable in the kitchen. The food for the entire meal was taken right out to the patio, well protected. They're used in every corner of the world, 600 million daily to be exact. That's a lot of disposable razors and a lot of guys who'd start their day differently if it wasn't for a salesman who got tired of knocking on doors. It's 1895 in Brookline, Massachusetts. King Gillette psychs himself to make his pitch on yet another porch. He was quite successful. He sold bottle caps up and down the East Coast. Almost everybody who met him seemed to like him. They found him very sort of easy to get along with and he had a sort of charm about him. But Gillette isn't a natural at sales. He hates rejection, and he's much happier making things than selling them. He was always taking bits of hardware out of his sales box and trying to improve them. He couldn't, you know, I think he was a bit of an obsessive and couldn't stop tinkering and thinking about improvement all the time. One guy Gillette really looks up to is his boss, William Painter the guy who invented the disposable bottle cap that Gillette's selling. And he'd had a tremendous success with one invention, which I think was the idea that most inventors, Gillette included, always have, is that one single idea is going to make your name. King, may I give you a piece of advice? The boss's advice will change everything. He tells Gillette, come up with a product that can only be used once something which creates a customer, a new customer, every time you sell him one because he uses it and he needs another one. In other words, something disposable. Until now, Gillette thought the key to success was building things that last. And the idea that something that encouraged waste or encouraged disposability was, uh, was a different way of thinking for him. Gillette can't stop thinking about his boss's advice. Inspiration comes suddenly in front of the bathroom mirror ah! in one painful moment. He's cut himself with a dull razor. It happens often in the 1800s because men are using the same thick, straight blade over and over again. The first problem shaving with a straight razor was just an open blade, which if it cut you, could cut you very deeply. The other problem was there was no penicillin and blood poisoning was pretty common. People would die from shaving. Gillette's imagination starts to whirl. What if he could create a razor that doesn't need sharpening? Something that could be thrown away before it gets dull, preventing all those nasty, dangerous cuts. At that point, he thought you'd use it once, and you'd throw it away, and you'd buy another one. For him, this was the eureka moment, so much so that he telegrammed his wife that day and said, 
I've got it, our fortune is made. Gillette starts experimenting with sheet steel, the only material that's inexpensive enough to be disposable. But he soon finds out it's too soft to keep a sharp edge. It was about six months before he got a prototype into shape, and that was not what you'd call a working prototype. It didn't work. You couldn't shave with it. He realizes he'll have to ask for help from people who know about metal. Gillette took it to people at MIT, he took it to cutlers, he took it to engineers. Everyone told him not to bother. They said that the sheet steel he was using was too soft and wouldn't take an edge, and it couldn't be forged or hardened because it was too thin. It would just buckle. He still doesn't give up, but his efforts are going nowhere until a young MIT grad arrives on the scene. William Nickerson at your service. William Nickerson was known by local businessmen and entrepreneurs as someone who could solve the unsolvable. If anyone could make Gillette's razor work, it was William Nickerson. Nickerson realizes that sheet steel on its own is not going to work. His first idea was to somehow get the metal to cool uniformly. So he interleaved the sheet steel with iron plates. At that point, the iron plates buckled as much as the steel did, and that didn't work. He tried to perforate each blade with a strange pattern that would relieve the lateral stresses as it cooled, and that didn't work either. Suddenly, the solution becomes clear. How about sandwiching? Using sheet steel in between other kinds of metal like the filling between slices of bread. Sheets of iron will provide outer strength. Sheets of copper will conduct heat. And in the middle, a thin layer of sheet steel for the blade. Now the blades can be heated and cooled without buckling. The result, a piece of metal thin enough to be a blade, strong enough to hold a sharp edge, and cheap enough to be mass-produced and disposable. Gillette patents the invention, and over the next decade, his razors sell by the millions. When America enters World War I, the U.S. government supplies its soldiers with Gillette razor kits. Because a close shave guarantees a tight-fitting gas mask, and increases the men's chances of surviving a gas attack. Gillette was the last of a breed of people, or among the last of a breed of people, who came up with a single idea, started a company, started manufacturing it, and became rich. Gillette, the guy who changed the face of a nation, and is still a household name more than a century later. Other bright ideas of the 1900s 1906, the electric cash register tallies the bill as fast as your fingers can fly and churns out a receipt for every sale. And 1901, the flamethrower, a scary new weapon that spews out flammable liquid at high velocity to stop the enemy in his tracks. Controlling indoor humidity was once just a crazy idea, as hopeless as ordering the rain to stop or the sun to shine. Until a brilliant guy from Buffalo proved that it is possible and that control means comfort. In 1902, Willis Carrier is a keen young electrical engineer working for a heating and ventilation company. On this muggy summer morning, he's on a mission. Carrier believed that you could do anything in life if you set your mind to it. He really believed in hard work. Today's job is at a high-end publishing company. Extreme heat and humidity are messing up the paper as it goes through the printing machines. Sackett Wilhelms was a publishing company that published in color and it was important for the paper to go through the printing presses the same way each time to take on a new color. 
The damp air is making the paper swell and shrink, so it's a different size every time it goes through the machine, which means the colors don't match up. Carrier's assignment? Figure out how to make room temperature and humidity remain constant. Controlling temperature is one thing, but nobody has ever come up with a safe and reliable way to control the exact percentage of humidity in a room. Carrier becomes obsessed. How to make a room less humid without making it too dry? One of Carrier's interesting personality traits was that he had tremendous focus. When he was thinking of an engineering problem, he couldn't be distracted by anything else. Uh, that meant that he often forgot everyday details of life. And everyone had a story about Carrier's famous absent-mindedness. Uh, when he was thinking about engineering, he thought of nothing else. Uh, once when he was traveling, he opened his suitcase to discover he had packed only one handkerchief and had nothing else in the suitcase. It's not until many weeks later, on the platform of a foggy train station, that it all starts coming together. Carrier knows that fog is air that's 100% saturated with water. That makes him wonder, what if he could create 100% humidity so he has an exact starting point? Then, add enough dry air to reduce humidity to 55% just like the boss ordered. Carrier knew if he could recreate fog, he would have 100% saturated air, he would know precisely how much humidity he had, and he would have the basics to reproduce any relative humidity that he wanted. Carrier gets to work. He puts together a box where he can trap air and control what happens to it inside. He also gathers a few common tool shed accessories, a couple of fans, a garden sprayer, and heating coils. He'll use one fan to suck hot outside air into the box. Then he'll lower the temperature of that air with a fine spray of cold water. As the air passes through the water, it turns into fog. Now, Carrier's got 100% relative humidity. Next, he starts reducing the level of humidity by adding a precise amount of dry air to the chamber, exactly the right amount to bring relative humidity down to 55%. Not too damp, not too dry. Now, Carrier can release that perfectly conditioned air into the printing room. His client is delighted with the result. Carrier's unique idea has created perfect temperature and humidity, the world's first air conditioner. A very few people would have thought of using water to take excess moisture out of the air. Carrier perfects his contraption and gets a patent in 1906. His invention revolutionizes everything from textile factories to movie theaters. Carrier reset our expectations about indoor comfort. We now expect to have wonderful weather every day, even if we have to stay inside to get it. He goes on to form Carrier Engineering Corporation with seven other bright young innovators. The result, an international success story worth billions. Other cool inventions of the 1900s? 1903, the crayon, a non-toxic stick of wax and pigment, turns kids into artists and marks the start of a colorful century. And 1908, 
the Model T Ford, nicknamed the Tin Lizzy, rolls off the assembly line and introduces modern mobility to middle-class America. Ever wonder where all those dust mites went before we had a machine to suck them out of hiding? An Ohio inventor found out the hard way and revolutionized carpet cleaning in the process. In 1907, James Spangler has a killer of a job. He's the night janitor in a department store. Problem is, the rugs are very dusty and Spangler's got asthma. It was a terrible environment for him to be in because nightly fits of coughing, and it described simply as fits of coughing, meant that 10, 15 minutes of his time was sitting down on the floor coughing, trying not to cough up blood. The early 1900s are a brutal time for anyone with asthma. Dust was everywhere. The streets and the sidewalks in Canton, Ohio were not paved. They were dirt streets. So people's shoes and boots brought a lot of this dirt into the department store. And the carpet sweeper itself, a primitive brush on wheels and a dustpan, only makes things worse for a guy with bad lungs. Spangler's desperate to come up with something better. Mr. Spangler dreamed big dreams. And he really dreamed of becoming a world famous inventor. Spangler's not famous, but he has invented some interesting things. He's got patents for a grain harvester and a velocipede wagon, but he hasn't made much money from either idea. Once you invent something, the next thing you have to do is sell it. And therein lies his problem because he wasn't a natural salesman. Uh, he also naturally didn't have the funds to be able to manufacture things that he invented. So he stuck doing menial jobs to make ends meet. Six nights a week for pennies an hour. All those months on the night shift are giving Spangler a lot of time to think. His mind was always working um, as any inventor's mind does, uh, the smallest of problems, he would think of ways to solve them or make them easier. One night, it suddenly dawns on Spangler. The answer might be right there in the room with him. The ceiling fan is powered by a small motor. What if that motor could be used in a rug sweeper to make pushing and pulling easier? As he unscrewed the fan blades, took them off, and set the motor into the carpet sweeper. And where the blades were, he took a leather belt and put it in a figure eight to the brush, power propelling the brush. The good news, adding a motor makes the sweeper a lot easier to push. The bad news, it creates more dust than ever. Oi, man, how is this supposed to help? so it kicked the dust straight up out of the machine into the air, which he had to breathe. Spangler needs to come up with something to direct and contain all that dust. Something like the blades from that ceiling fan. He encloses a smaller version of those blades in a tin box that's attached to the sweeper. The motor rotates the brush and beats the dirt from the carpet while the revolving blades suck the debris upward. Straight into a pillowcase that Spangler's found in a linen closet. His time to empty signal was when the fan motor blew the pillowcase off the back of the machine through the back pressure. Oh, stop, empty it. <laughs> it's clear he needs to make a few adjustments. He keeps using the department store as his laboratory. He started to perfect it. He would make the fans out of a different shape. He would make the opening different. And so night after night after night, it started to really work. And he could see the color come back to the carpets. Spangler has invented the electric carpet sweeper. What he came up with in that department store, cobbled together from bits and things that he had in that janitor's closet, are still 
today the perfect way of getting a carpet completely clean. Oh, you missed the spot. In August 1908, James Spangler sells his invention to a relative, William Hoover. And we've been hoovering our floors ever since. More inventions of the 1900s. 1903, safety glass. Invented by accident when a chemist forgets to wash liquid plastic out of a glass container. The result? A window that doesn't shatter. Smash and grab, eh, my friend? But before you can grab, you've got to be able to smash. And that's just what you can't do to this window. 1901. Instant coffee, so your morning jolt brews in seconds, not minutes, and stays fresh indefinitely. As delicious as the best cup of coffee you ever have brewed. And 1903. The windshield wiper. A distraction at first that quickly becomes a must-have for millions of drivers. For millennia, we could only dream of soaring with the birds. Today, we take it for granted. Thanks to the genius and courage of the Wright brothers. In 1896, they're the go-to guys in Dayton, Ohio. Wilbur and Orville build and sell bikes. They're also known as the most helpful handy guys around. If you'd live next to the Wright brothers in Dayton in 1896, 1897, you would have thought of them as great guys, honest as the day is long, but you never would have picked them out uh, as two people who were gonna change the world with the invention of the airplane. Neither of them finished high school, but they both have a knack for understanding how things work, especially mechanical things like bicycles. All the rage in 1896, but bikes aren't the only new contraptions getting attention. Around the world, would-be inventors are building gliders and trying to fly them. The most famous, Otto Lilienthal of Germany, has attempted more than 2,000 flights. But in 1896, he crashes and dies, making headlines as far away as Ohio. You can almost see the light bulb go off over Wilbur Wright's head. And he said later, it was at that moment that he began to think to himself, well, you know, the great Lilienthal is dead. Maybe we can pick up that gauntlet and push this thing forward a little farther. And I think... It's at that moment in 1896, again, that the spark catches and the light bulb goes off and uh, Wilbur Wright and then Orville Wright begin to think seriously about flying machine experiments. Wilbur and Orville believe Lilienthal was on the right track by trying to control a glider before trying to build a plane with a motor. The brothers already know something about how to control motion from their work with bicycles. If you think about a bicycle, you have to lean into a turn with a bicycle. And uh, that gave them a conceptual notion of, of how complicated it was going to be to turn an airplane. They also figure out that in order to fly, you need control on three separate axes, nose up or nose down, known as pitch, nose right or nose left, also called yaw, and the third axis, wing up or wing down, or lateral movement. The tough one was how do you control an airplane like this? The masters of that tricky lateral movement are birds banking effortlessly on currents of air. The Wright brothers notice they can change the angle of their wingtips to create lateral motion. It's a concept known as wing warping. The challenge, how to build wing warping into a machine. An event at the bike shop provides the critical clue. Can I purchase a bicycle in a tube, please? That'd be two cents. 
The long, narrow box reminds Orville of wings. And what if he could find a way to build a glider with wings that twist one way or the other? The breakthrough idea was the notion that by changing the geometry of the wing, by twisting it, you could increase or decrease the lift on either side of the wing, and that meant you could balance the wing. Orville has just figured out how to adapt the concept of wing warping for human use. For the next two years, the brothers experiment, starting with a small box kite on ropes and working their way up to a full-scale glider big enough to carry a man. By the summer of 1901, they need somewhere to test it. They knew that they needed to fly into strong, steady winds to increase the lift of their wings. And they wrote to the Weather Bureau, which sent them a list of the windiest places in the country. Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, has the right kind of wind. It also has sand dunes high enough to launch their glider. Wilbur writes a letter. Uh, he gets a letter back from sort of the leading citizen of Kitty Hawk uh, saying, yeah, strong, steady winds, dunes to fly from. And if you come down, I can promise you friendly folk who will give you a hand. And that was enough for Wilbur Wright. He was on his way to Kitty Hawk. Orville poses with her strange looking invention, nose pointing upward with huge wings and no tail. First, they test it without a pilot, checking the wing warping with control ropes from the ground. The results are encouraging. Now Wilbur, the older brother, prepares to test it in the air. What you have to remember is that what these guys are doing is inherently dangerous. This not only took intellectual brilliance, but it took real physical courage. Wilbur launches himself into the unknown, reaching a maximum altitude of 122 meters. And it turns out to be just an extraordinarily frightening experience. Wilbur is almost killed because the glider tends to spin out of control. The machine would do all sorts of squirrely things. You would be flying along, you'd be struck by a gust, you would increase, you'd warp the wings, and instead of coming back to normal, you would begin to get control reversely. They thought they'd solved the wing warping problem, but they hadn't. They had gone into this determined that they would understand control first and foremost, and now there was a problem that they hadn't expected. And there's a second major problem. Their prototype isn't getting nearly enough lift. And they actually talked about um, stopping, about quitting. Man will never fly, not in our lifetime. By autumn of 1901, it looks like the Wright brothers' bold experiment will be just another footnote in the history of flight. Sometimes when they warped one side of the wing up, instead of increasing the lift and restoring balance, uh, the increase in the drag would cause the airplane to come back like this. And uh, so you'd be going into a, a spin, as it were. Their test flights have led to an important discovery. Lateral movement must be controlled simultaneously with left to right motion, or yaw. And what they discovered was that if you link the wing warping with the rudder so that when you warp the wing, this happens, then you really do balance it and uh, the wing warping works. The solution, make a different kind of rudder. Instead of the fixed rudder of their first glider, they'll make the next one movable so it can compensate when wing warping puts the plane into a spin. They've figured out the control issue, but they still have to solve their lift problem. Until now, they've been using the same wing design data as the German Otto Lilienthal. They now believe he miscalculated when figuring out the shape of his wings. So they build a wind tunnel to do their own calculations. It was a wooden box about six feet long with a fan on one end. 
The ingenious part, the brilliant part, was the balance that went inside the wind tunnel. It was made out of hacksaw blades and bicycle wire, and you pin these little model wings onto it. This is a thing that you can hold in the palm of your hand, and yet, when you run wings, a wind over the model wing that's mounted on the balance, a little needle at the bottom of the balance pops out the number that you need to calculate the coefficient of lift or drag. They spend months testing 200 different wing shapes to determine which shape will provide the best lift. Their tests show if they make the wing thicker at the front end, so it tapers like a teardrop at the back end, it will decrease air pressure above the wing and increase pressure below the wing, a design that maximizes lift. And it's when you see how they've done that kind of thing that you begin to realize that these are no ordinary lucky bicycle mechanics. These guys are engineers of genius who have a clarity of vision that's extraordinary. Summer 1902, the Wright brothers head back to Kitty Hawk, eager to test their new, improved glider. Well, the brothers must have been apprehensive. They knew that the airplane was, in fact, very difficult to control and that what they were doing was really tough. But the latest glider works magnificently. It's got great lift, and wing warping works nicely with that new, movable rudder. 1902, it's a wonderful year for them because now everything's in place. They can make glide after glide after glide after glide. They are in pretty much control of the airplane now, the glider, and they know that this is it. They have now moved beyond anybody else. And the following year, they move even further. The brothers roll out the Flyer, a motorized version of their glider. They've added a gasoline engine built in their bike shop and wooden propellers they designed and carved themselves. December 17th, 1903, a small crowd gathers on the dunes at Kitty Hawk. Orville climbs aboard. The spectators hold their breath. That first motorized flight lasts only 12 seconds, but it's enough to change history. Wilbur runs ecstatically alongside. It's not all that often when a really important first, a real breakthrough takes place, and we have an image of that moment. Uh, that picture shows you the very first time in the history of the world that a powered, controlled airplane is leaving the ground in full flight. And there it is for you to, uh, to see. It's that picture of uh, the beginning. The brothers take three more flights that day, working up to a full minute in the air. After December 17th, what you heard people say was, wow, if we, if human beings can do that, can actually build a machine that'll take off and fly into the sky, what can't we do? I mean, it, it sort of opened the doors of possibility on the 20th century. The Wright brothers soar to celebrity status for proving that sky-high ideas can become reality. And so end the trend-setting 1900s. In what was